The Paperclip Murders, Chapter 20, An Angel All the Way. The exit led to the roof, and when I got there it was much as I'd expected. The wind blew across the rooftop with just the right touch of foreboding. The sky was gray and moody, and there was the unmistakable feeling that permeated the air, a sense of dread which could only be described as the feeling that everything was about to go straight to hell. Uncannily, it was like most weddings I've attended. Samantha was standing on the other side of the roof from me, looking like a cornered tigress. I thought that perhaps this called for a tactful approach, and I slipped retribution back in her holster and loaded my lips with a nicotine bullet. I took a step towards her and she called out, Don't! Don't you come near me! Her eyes were wild, her breath came in quick gasps from the run, and she was altogether the most beautiful thing I had seen since 7 a.m. I responded with, don't do anything rash, doll. It's over. I know what they did to you, Samantha. I know it. And if it were up to me, I'd call it good and buy you a drink. But it ain't up to me. It's up to Lady Justice, and she's made last call before we got up here. I took another step. Hands raised slightly, and she flinched and took a step backwards. I continued. Hennessy and Brock, they got what was coming to them, far as I'm concerned. But Woodchuck... He was just in the wrong time at the wrong place. Hurting him would make about as much sense as slapping a bunny across the face a few dozen times. Samantha backed further away, hands held out protectively in front of her. If I could just get my cuffs on her. You don't understand? No one can. What they did... Men like that can only be stopped one way. I got it. I really did. She could have screamed her head off, got the papers and the police involved, but Hennessy and Brock had money, and they worked for pillar and pillar. Of course they would make the charges go away. And for her to have to relive that, to have to tell people in court what kind of terrible things were done to her, to have defense lawyers blame her and accuse her for being the victim. I got angry all over again. Sometimes, ladies and gents, serving up justice is rather like working with your mother-in-law in Hell's Kitchen. The other one. I frowned. I hate that I have to take you in, Samantha. I do. But I promise you, I promise you, I'll do everything I can to help you. Everything. Something in her face changed. Maybe it softened a bit. She took a deep breath, thinking for just a moment, and then quietly stepped forward, extending her wrists. I resigned myself to feeling like a scum bucket for the next few days, and pulled the cuffs, reaching towards her arms and... Her gloved hands came up holding paper clips, the pointed ends sticking out like daggers. Her first swing I barely dodged, and the paper clip punctured the cigarette between my lips and absconded with it. I didn't have time to even think, let alone attempt to reason with the felonous female, as she peppered the air around me with poisonous punctuation. It was mostly just irk and gack and woof escaping my lips, as I ducked and dodged and sidestepped and evaded. Add a little circus music and I could have passed as her very own trained dancing monkey. Her breath gasped through bared teeth as she stabbed at me yet again, her onslaught pushing me back against the railings separating me in a very short time to regret I hadn't been born a bird, and out of desperation I pulled retribution back from her nest and fired as I spun away. The bullet struck oil in her shoulder and knocked her sprawling, her sudden cry a mixture of agony and rage. I scooped my hat up from where it had fallen with my left hand, my right hand training the gun on Samantha as she staggered back to her feet, her angry eyes flashing fire and brimstone at me. She held her shoulder with the other hand and the fight appeared to go out of her. Dad gum it, woman! I growled in frustration through my teeth, my heart climbing back into my chest. Don't make me... I never finished that sentence. It was as if the sun had shone through the darkest of clouds and illuminated the spot in between us, and revealed the ugliest of elephants hiding naked in a corner. I could see the hurt in her eyes, the desperation. I could see the calculations she was making, the realizations that she would go to jail, to prison, that she would be forever branded something other than the most broken of victims. My gun lowered by itself, and without even thinking I extended my other hand towards her, words lost in the jumble of blue and gray the colors of the sky between us. I could only hope that however silently it screamed, she could hear my plea, read my offer of help. I got out only a, don't, and then like a gazelle, she slipped one leg over the railing, effortlessly, followed it with the other, and backed out into space.
Those eyes stayed on me, somehow, even while the rest of her disappeared like a terrible magician's trick. My motor reflexes took over and propelled me to the edge in some semblance of a copycat jumper without the conviction. She was an angel all the way down. Epilogue. A week later, I had finished typing up a complete expense report to give to Woodchuck's secretary. Woodchuck, for his part, played the role of gracious victim to an absolute T, including giving his would-be killer a funeral to die for, if you'll pardon the expression, and making a substantial donation in her name to a charity that helped female victims of abuse. And of course, his gratitude at still being alive, thanks in large part to myself, also found its way into my bank account, setting me up nice and tidy for a while. I think he still felt guilty about his part in Samantha's unfortunate story. His eyes retained that sort of haunted look in them for a long time after. Brock's widowed wife was let out of the Huskow without any further issue, and though she struggled internally with her unresolved feelings about her husband, as far as I know, she got herself back on track. I didn't have much reason to keep tabs on her, of course, so she disappeared back into the woodwork. The Clown Mafia remained a shadowy threat on the edge of my brain's peripheral vision, something to keep me up at nights over a bowl of vodka and a good fire, always just out of sight, like a good boogeyman should be. Buster's remained the place that I would go to drown my sorrows, or to get Stravinsky soused for tips he brought to me. And while the quality of the liquor eventually cleared up, Buster and I kept the nature of our acquaintance as muddy as ever. And there's me, Carrington Gray, a world-class detective. I'd be visited by Samantha's last look many times over the next few years, when the night was still, and the air had that quality of just about to kill you. And I'd silently apologize to ghosts for my failures to do more than I had. But justice, my ever-present madam, the one true queen of my heart, was not a mistress given to fairness or fancy, and whatever failure I thought I'd allowed, she was always there to make certain of one thing. Whatever the motive, eventually everyone paid her in full. Until next time, ladies and gents, keep your noses clean. <laughs>